Hi, I'm Femi OK, host of The Stream. I was lurking in the YouTube comments section of last weekend's show and I spotted, oh no, this is a rerun. Viewers, I wouldn't do that to you. This is not a rerun. This is the bonus edition of The Stream where you get to see the conversations that I have with the guests after the live show has ended. So everything in today's episode is an exclusive, never aired on TV before. Coming up, a mysterious mind map and how it connects to a recent stream discussion about Nicaragua. If you look really closely, you may well see a few clues. And this next picture takes us back to an era in US history when residential boarding schools were set up to destroy the culture of indigenous children. It's the same boy. This Navajo youngster, when he was taken to the Carlisle Indian Boarding School in 1882, right here, and then three years later, cultural genocide in two frames. More on the impact of the residential schools in America later in this episode. Let's start with the Euro 2020 Football Championship final. Last week, Italy took the cup home after a tense penalty shootout. And in England, there was disappointment and also pride for how well the team had played. But what's been making headlines for days is the racist abuse unleashed on the three black England players who missed penalties. CJ Thomas joined the stream to talk about racism in British football. He's a presenter for Arsenal Fan TV and a former professional football player. In our post-show chat, we tried to work out if there was any way to stop the abuse of black and brown players by some fans. I'm trying to find positives, but it, it, it's, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Like I said, we are superheroes when everything's going well. Uh, the villains, when, when it's not going the way the country want it to. Um, but again, uh, and like I said before as well, there's those organisations that are trying to put awareness on and the light on racism. And I am thankful for that because it... it it has improved it because the conversation are being, is conversations being had. I just want to see change. That's, that's all I ask. I want to see more change. And people always ask me, well, Cecil, what's the answer then? How, how, do, we, how do we provide change? And I'm like, I, I've never been a racist in my life. I don't know how to change it. I've never been in their shoes and, and understood why people are racist. Why are you asking me? How can I be the victim and then be the person to answer, give you the answers to how to fix it as well? Like, that shouldn't be my job. So... It's a tough one. I always feel we we got a short straw um, being of colour or being black. Um, and actually, in any discrimination, any forms of discrimination to any race or sexuality, in a sense of that they they we are the victims, then we, we have to give them the answers as well on how to change it. I, I don't think it's fair, um, and it shouldn't be like that. Uh, and like I said before, I was born in Britain. This is this is the country I lived in. I grew up in. I succeeded in. I've had a career in football. I've had a career in entertainment um, in this country. But still, when things aren't going the way that a small minority uh, wanted to, I get reminded about my race and, you know, go back to the country that I was born in. It's, 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 it's tough. How can you be racist to a player like, like Saka? Go Google an image of him. Look at him. He's so innocent. Oh, they're babies. Just, <laughs> he's 19 years old. Yeah. 19 years old. Like, it, it pains me to think what he was going through seeing those messages and, and seeing seeing how much hate he got after missing that penalty. He's a 19-year-old boy who's done more than... He's a boy. Anyone He's a teenager. Happen. Sometimes it's hard to be an English person because there's a lot of baggage that we have. And that team are so extraordinary that it makes you really proud, right? Yeah, it does. It does. Not, it not does easy sometimes to see that flag and feel comfortable as a person of colour who's British. Yeah, in English. yeah, yeah, exactly, Femi. You're you're spot on, absolutely spot on. It's it's a sense of I I've seen many England teams, but I, like I said at the start of this, I connected with this England team more than any yeah. any other England team in my life. Um, the videos of them in, in training camp, playing games with each other, doing pranks with each other, yeah. um, have water balloon fights. Um, there's rival team rival teammates. So like Harry Kane and Saka. They they are they're supposed to be they're supposed to hate each other but as soon as they arrive they embrace each other with a cuddle. Yeah. Um, they said there's no rivalry here. We're here for one mission, obviously to do well for the country. And yeah. you buy into that. I bought into yeah, it. Yeah, I did too. I, I love this England side. Yeah. And they stand for so much. Um, there's so much. Jordan Henderson standing up for racial inequalities as well. Um, supporting his black players, never afraid to speak on it. Gareth Southgate being a manager and saying 
booing the knee is wrong. We're going to continue to boo the knee. Like, there was so much that we can all buy into this England team, so much. And um, Phil Foden even dyeing his hair to represent uh, Paul Gascoigne against Scotland. <laughs> at, at, well, that's a era. name from the past. <laughs> Paul Gascoigne was, was a brilliant football player. He, he used to get himself into a little bit of trouble, but uh, you can Google yeah. him. Uh, CJ, let, yeah, me, let, let, me play, let me play this to you, if I may. Um, there are 20 players, um, uh, a mixture of uh, female football players and, and male football players. They all play in the UK. They got together and they, 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 the group is called Hope United and they're just speaking out against hate. Let, let's have a listen. Let's have a look. I made a change in using social media just because of um, a barrage of abuse. Daily, I'd get abuse on social media. Yeah, I've had so much over the years. Racist abuse. Homophobia. Sexism. Death, rape. Open that, you know what I do, a serious injury. Just hatred. But it's not just on the pitch, it's everywhere. One in ten of us have received online abuse in the past year. Which is why BT have created Hope United. Top footballers from all four home nations coming together to tackle online hate and give us the digital skills we need to help fight it. We all have a duty to speak up and do more. And as experts in tech, we're proud to be in a position to help. Join Hope United and help tackle online hate. Yeah. So CJ, so, respect, respect to those players, but you're saying it doesn't work, right? This enough. Um, doesn't work. Let me tell you, some, let me tell you something, uh, a little insider. I was on that shoot. I was there in Manchester, in Media City with BT. I was on that shoot. I was body doubling Rashford. So the shots you see, I was part of that. Um, the advert, the campaign, I was there. So I saw it all. I have, there's a, if you got, this is not going to be a nice self plug, but if you go on my social media, you'll see I have the Hope United top on. I, I was there. But again, it was all well and good, and it was an amazing shoot, but, and it looked all fancy and glitz and glam. But after the, the adverts come out and all that, you just think, well, what, else, what is it? It's, it's, it's a campaign to highlight um, that they're against abuse, online abuse. But again, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough because it's still happening. It's still happening. And, and no, I don't have all the answers. I, of course not. I, what I about, have what about accountability or consequences? So if you are racist and you are doing it online or you're sending a letter yep. or you're sending abuse, you get sent to prison. Yeah, I mean, that would be... Right? That would be, that would be different. That would, that be, yeah, that should be the right course of action. And, yeah. it, and again, that would probably, that would probably be very effective. However, um, Ian Wright recently got abused online mm -hmm. by, I think it was like a 12-year-old or 14-year-old... Former nothing, British nothing football happened. player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. A legend, Arsenal legend, got legend. abused. Um, monkey chants, um, really, and more than that. Uh, sorry, monkey emojis, and more than that. There was very, very derogatory. Uh, sorry, very racist is yeah. remarks from this young boy. Unbelievable. Nothing happened. He got, he got to delete his account, do an apology, oh. and a slap in the wrist. So again, it's it's, and I don't want to keep saying it, it's education. It's education. It's yeah. education because. That's what we've heard of that. And when the Black Lives Matter movement happened, it was all about, you need to educate yourself, you need to educate yourself. But people are lazy and people don't really want to do that. Really, we should be doing it with education systems within our, in the UK. It should start from that. We shouldn't have our first lessons on black slavery. I don't, by my first lesson in school, I went to a white school and it was all about yeah. me being, my ancestors being slaves. And do you know how awkward that made me feel? Yeah, but that's yeah. the, the entry point to being black. Sure. Um, that's wrong. And again, like you said, the punishments, what you just said there, Femi, if they were increased, I'm sure things would change. It would but change. You went to and... prison. You got jail yeah, time. It, it would, wow. Exactly. That would, that would really help. But yes. it doesn't benefit the English system mm. and their rules or yeah. anything like that. It doesn't financially better them. So it's not going to happen. Former professional football player CJ Thomas sharing some home truths about racism in English football. And now, remember that mind map? This is how stream producer Andy Coombs plots every show he works on. He starts on his notepad with the central premise for the discussion. And as Andy researches the topic, he adds important issues and how they connect together. Let's see if I can find a few for you. In the center, Nicaragua's latest arrests. Arrow, legacy of the 2018 protests. Follow the arrow down here, election, and then right at the bottom, Wait and see till November the 7th election, question mark. 
Now, Andy describes this process as being the scribblings of a madman. I disagree. This right here, it's a work of art, a little glimpse into the mind of a stream producer. We covered a lot of the material in Andy's mind map during a discussion about the current political climate in Nicaragua. After the live broadcast, I talked to the guests about the US imposing new visa restrictions on Nicaraguan lawmakers and what impact that might have on President Ortega's government. Well, the US has actually already been imposing several rounds of sanctions against uh, over 30 uh, between officials, government officials and allies, um, as well as some entities, public entities, including the national police as a whole. As an organization, um, so it's not it's not new that the U.S. uses this, this sort of tool, uh, which is sanctions. Of course, the fact that they are uh, keeping on, uh, you know, sanctioning uh, individuals that are being uh, believed to be tied to the government is, is positive because it means that there is a commitment, there is an attention being being paid by Washington on the situation. Whether that can, you know, uh, diverge the course of Ortega or influence in his choices is really, we have more doubts about that. Uh, but we also uh, understand that doing nothing um, in this situation, and particularly after the election takes place, um, if it takes place as it seems to be taking place, there needs to be an international response because others in the region are looking, are watching. It is crucial to increase the price the cost of this abuse of power by Ortega. And uh, the announcement of uh, targeted sanctions uh, that consist on canceling visas and freezing assets to um, top members of that uh, administration, uh, dictatorship, is, I think, excellent news. Uh, it, it is important that those sanctions also come from Europe and from Canada, and ideally from democracies in Latin America. So uh, what um, uh, Ortega has to feel is that, uh, that his actions actually have generated a reaction at international level. And uh, Ortega is a transactional uh, leader who will pay close attention to this kind of um, reactions. It's important, as Tiziano said, that uh, what is happening in, in, in Nicaragua is not normalized in the rest of Latin America. So, uh, you know, not only because it's wrong, but also because it's going to create conditions for other leaders in the region with autocratic tendencies to replicate what Ortega is doing. You know, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think that with the situation in Nicaragua, we are facing the limits of the international diplomacy and the limits also of the legal frame. Because the situation in Nicaragua, it doesn't start today. We have been, uh, since Ortega came to power, uh, saying that this guy has a very um, clear plan that has been also expressed by him that he wants to do it, all the things that already doing. So what we ask ourselves is how we can protect people from these kind of governments. And sometimes the discussions in, uh, in terms of what a country can do is around, hey, we have to respect uh, the sovereignty of a country. But we are saying, hey, what happened with the sovereignty of the people, you know? Um, so right now, I think we are facing the challenge of that. And I think that Ortega is a guy with a lot of experience uh, that know how this system works, mm -hmm. and that he is willing to do all the things that he's doing, knowing that this is going to have consequences. You know, I think Ortega is very clear that it's a strong possibility that in the future he get a kick out of the OAS. He knows that he's going to receive more sanctions, already had a lot, has a lot of sanctions. He cannot get out of the country, no one from his family. So the thing is how we create a united front that uh, combines uh, countries and very important what the Banco said, Latin America has to jump in, and the left of Latin America, the beliefs in democracy, has to jump in. But also this has to go hand in hand with pressures in terms of economy and cutting the funds for the police and the army. 
I think these things together can put Ortega in a position that he has to be forced to bring free elections to Nicaragua. Not something that is going to happen in two years, three years, four years, which is the thing that he has been saying to Almagro, for example, that Almagro has been talking with Ortega for five years with no results. So he has to be pressured to bring free election as soon as possible with no political prisoners and with watchers that are going to make sure that these elections are free. General elections in Nicaragua will be held in November. Look out for the coverage on Al Jazeera. Finally, following the discovery of unmarked graves of indigenous children at residential schools in Canada, the U.S. government will be conducting an investigation into the country's own dark history. The original concept of taking indigenous children away from their homes came from the United States, where they started in 1819. One school's founder said they served to kill the Indian to save the man. Guests Mary Annette Pember, Marka Black Elk and Christine Dindinsi McCleave all have family members who were forced into residential schools. After the show, I asked them how they made sense of a US policy designed to destroy their culture. Well, you know, the, I began looking into boarding schools more just in trying to figure out what was going on with my family and myself and to kind of deal with our dis-ease and all these sort of uh, hit topics that were, you know, half spoken of. And so it was a real process of self-discovery in many ways for me um, and finding out to slowly kind of like taking apart the tapestry that was my mother in her life and then also in using the, my skills as a journalist then to document uh, what happened. And I'm actually working on a book now I think framing, you know, the history of uh, boarding schools through my mother's, through the lens of her life, and and also my process of of untangling that, and I hope that that will be uh, informative to people as we move through this. I don't want to spoil people for buying the book, Mary, because buy the book. But was there a moment where you had a conversation with your mum, and you will never forget that conversation? Something that she told you about her background of attending a residential school. Well, you know, from my earliest memories, they were my bedtime stories, sister school stories. And, you know, the big story she always told me over and over again was about Sister Mary Catherine, who was especially, she was the uh, uh, superintendent of the school and she was especially uh, cruel. And uh, during one Christmas season, apparently she fell, my, for my mother's story, she fell down the cellar steps, she hit her head and she died. And my mother said, oh, what a silent cheer us kids did. And my mother sort of had a way of reinventing herself through these stories. And so I was never clear if it actually happened. But in the process of doing the research, I was in the, the archives of the Catholic Church, and I was looking at some of this correspondence uh, between the principal of St. Mary's uh, School and uh, the director of the Bureau of uh, of uh, Indian boarding schools in Washington, D.C., and it's actually a letter from the sister secretary to the director saying, you know, this is to inform you that uh, Mother Superior Catherine fell down the cellar steps and hit the bottom step with such force that it drove her glasses into her head, and then, you know, we think that by the time you receive this letter, she will have passed away, and we know you'll join us in, uh, in praying for her soul. Um, I read that, and I stood straight up out of my chair. You know, it was like, these were not fairy stories. These were real stories. And I think that that's, um, that's how many of us have uh, grown to know, and about, know about boarding schools, is, are through stories like this that our parents shared. Marka, it, it feels so strange that you attended a school that was a residential school, that you teach and then you educate about healing. What is that like? Are you surrounded by ghosts? Are you surrounded by the ancestors? How does that fuel what you do? I, yeah, I think there's a real um, challenge to being in a school that is a former boarding school. Uh, I, of course, attended there myself, but it was not no longer a boarding school at that point. But absolutely, the, the stories like the one Mary tells, those stories are with us in our community. My family has stories like that that are passed on. And though the school today is very, very different, that legacy is still really real and felt. And it's important, especially in the process that we're going through, we're the only Catholic school in the country, as far as we know, that is engaging in this process and in the hopes that the greater Catholic Church you know, moves to do the same. Uh, that really there's an importance in revealing that truth and sharing those stories 
and making that a real part of who we are moving forward in order to heal because that hard truth has to come first. Christine, Robert Adams was watching our live show and he asked a very simple question that's a very complicated answer, I am sure. How can this be fixed? Yeah, very simple question, very big answer. Um, it's a complicated issue. It uh, involves, you know, uh, a federal trust obligation from, from this government to sovereign tribal nations. Um, it involves generations of families and individuals. It involves, um, you know, culture, and uh, it's, it's complicated. What we need to focus on is having conversations that, that explore this at all levels of our society and our communities. And, you know, to what Mary and Macaw were talking about, I also have family history. My grandfather went to Indian boarding school and my great-grandfather went to Carlisle. And the boarding school that my grandfather went to was Marty Catholic Indian School, and he never talked about what happened to him there. All he said was that he didn't want to step foot in the Catholic Church again. And that's what caused me to go and do my master's thesis on Native spirituality and Christianity. So, you know, exploring these things um, in our lives, exploring these conversations in our families, I think that's where all this, I think that's where healing begins. The end of the investigation into the residential schools that the uh, minister, uh, the Secretary of uh, Interior is, is leading could that end in the U.S. actually saying, yes, this was genocide or, yes, this was cultural genocide? Is that a possibility? Mary, you start. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think, you know, to me, it's very, very revealing that this uh, question you gave is, how can we fix this? That's always what, uh, p forgive me, I'm just going to say it. That's always what white America wants to know. This is uncom an uncomfortable truth. We don't want to deal with this. We want to get better. We want to move on. You know, it's like, how do we fix this? How long have you got? You know, this is something we've been living with for generations. I think just being, uh, educating yourself a little bit on, uh, in, in, in an area that is uncomfortable, you know, um, that is a start. And integrating that into our educational system, where primarily the history that Native, uh, uh, we tell our uh, students about Native people are their fairy tales. You know, they really relate very little to, to actual, to reality. So, uh, you know, w I don't really know if they will apologize, and I don't really know how terribly meaningful that is, at least to me personally. I just would like to be able to know what happened. Um, I would just like some transparency. Now, I think that actually the National Archives, it's there. Um, I think it's just really, you know, omission in many ways by, you know, um, by the United States. I think the archivists would be tremendously helpful. I think they want people to come look at their archives. So it's there. I think our real stumbling block is going to be with the Christian denominations, particularly with the Catholics. Oh, Maka, that's your cue. <laughs> yes, I mean, I actually really agree with a lot of what Mary had said here. You know, even though we are one Catholic institution that is engaging in this, you know, many people have called for the Catholic Church widely or the Pope, for example, to apologize. That's the easiest and least that they could do. The more difficult work is the engagement and the and the opening of that record of the record, the confrontation with that true history. But our hope is that through our inspiration here, that that will happen more broadly. And really, the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, I hope has learned from its history in, in recent memory from their sexual abuse crisis. But the answer isn't to run away and become defensive. The answer is to step forward and take responsibility. And I hope that's what churches begin to do, and that's what we're starting to do and trying to do. Christine. Well, here at the Boarding School Healing Coalition, we are still calling for a federal truth commission. We believe that um, the commission will be able to finish the investigation that has been started by the Interior. And, you know, from studying truth commissions around the world, and especially looking to our relatives in the North and Canada, and seeing how the 94 recommendations that came out of their Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, have not fully been implemented, we know that commissions are not the end-all, be-all. But um, in addition to examining the truth and telling the full scope of the history, it does get us into the conversation of, and how do we move forward? And how do we repair mm -hmm. what was broken and lost? And so um, I would also like to point out that according to the United Nations Geneva Convention, the definition of genocide includes removing children and forcibly transferring them to another group. So cultural yeah. genocide is genocide. 
There is still so much to learn about the legacy of residential schools in the United States and Canada. You can see the two recent discussions I've hosted about them at stream.aljazeera.com. And that's our show for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.